<laughs> but she did say, Aaron did say, that the government has some explaining to do. And they do. And it's very hard to explain a lie. And that's the problem that the government has right now. You see, I've had the privilege of sitting in government. And, um, and the structure of government hasn't changed, whether it was under W.A.C. Bennett or under us, uh, Mike Harcourt, or, uh, or with the, the current chaps. The fact of the matter is that you have a committee called Treasury Board. It's your finance committee of, uh, of government. I have had the privilege of sitting on Treasury Board. And you meet every Wednesday, and their system hasn't changed at all. And every Wednesday, uh, you get a report from the Ministry of Finance indicating the state of the province's finances. Now, why do you get that? You get that because you're working within a context of a budget that you presented to the legislature. If revenues are off, or if expenditures are beyond what one had expected, you have to do your shaving there at Treasury Board. And so different ministers are called in when you have problems at Treasury Board, either to explain the, the downfall in revenue or to explain the, the heightened expenditures. So in the ordinary daily management of government, you get your professionals coming in all the time telling you where you are on your revenue and where you are on your expenditures. Now, the market collapse happened in October. The budget was presented in February. You know, I would cut the government some slack if indeed the collapse happened in May on the eve of an election campaign. But they, like every other government in the country and around the globe, knew that we were on the edge of, quite frankly, what was a, a fiscal mess particularly in the, in the banking sector, driven largely by what was happening in the United States. Thank God, our regulatory system, and I think it is a reflection of our left-wing leaning in this country, that we have a stronger regulatory system for our banks in Canada than we do elsewhere. Thankfully, we weren't going to be hit as hard as other jurisdictions were. But we were going to be hit, and we were going to be hit hard. The federal government said that. The provincial government chose to pretend that we were going to be immune to the flu that was raging right across the, uh, the, the, the globe. Why did they decide that they were going to pretend to be immune? Well, because it was politically self-serving for them to pretend that they were going to be immune. Politically self-serving first in the context that they had a reputation as fiscal managers to maintain going into an election. And secondly, politically self-serving, because they had to get through an election campaign and to be able to hold on to the fiction that somehow they could manage British Columbia in a way that no other jurisdiction was managing its finances. Now, the backdrop to all that was the meetings at Treasury Board. I've been there. You get your reports. And in November and in December and in January and February, you had to have a pretty good idea that revenues were going south. And you had a pretty good idea where your expenditures were. So they walked into the election knowing that there was a problem. They weren't the only ones. The NDP knew that. They asked questions to the, to the government about, uh, about the state of the finances. And more appropriately, the media knew that. And the media went after Mr. Campbell in terms of the viability of the $495 million deficit. And he played possum to those inquiries by the media. Now, my view, the media should have been far more aggressive. I think the NDP should have been far more aggressive. A little bit of that is hindsight, and a little bit, I think, is criticism to both parties for not being as aggressive enough. And I, quite frankly, I think both the opposition and, 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 and the media, which is the other pillar in our society, just didn't do what they were supposed to have done. But the government did not do what they were supposed to have done, which is to fully disclose during the election campaign what the state of the province's finances were. And they knew during the campaign. The Minister of Finance has said that he was, in passing, told uh, what was going on. The Premier, shortly around the time of the debate, when, she, when he was put on the defensive by, by Ms. James, knew that the, the revenue was going south. Okay, so they have, it, you have a lot of explaining to do when the public can see that you didn't disclose, that you weren't being truthful, that you misled them. So that's problem number one. It's a political problem, and that gum on their shoe is going to be there for the next 44 months, because once the public begins to think that you're lying to them, it's pretty hard to get out of that corner. Now, the other corner the government got into was immediately after the election campaign, they had to face reality. The reality was that there was a fiscal imbalance in terms of revenue and expenditures, and it sure as heck wasn't $495 million. Now, I've been on Treasury Board, and I understand that sometimes the forecasters will come in with numbers that still aren't real. They may have come in with a billion. They may have come with a billion and a half. They probably didn't come in with uh, $4 billion. But that's essentially what the deficit was. So they probably landed somewhere, ha somewhere in the, I guess, my guess would be, just from experience, somewhere in the neighborhood of two, two and a half billion bucks. So we're out of kilter. 
the government has a problem. They have a political problem. They know that they lied. They have a political problem because they have built their whole entire image on, on, on fiscal management, and so they have to deal with it somehow. Easiest way to deal with it was to try to bring in uh, the HST. Now, here's a policy which when they brought in, sorry, during the election campaign, they said it was not good for British Columbia, would not be something that they would implement, and was something that they wouldn't support. Immediately after the election, they said it was the best thing that could be done for business. Well, it was so good for business now. Why wasn't it so good for business back then, prior to the election campaign? Clearly, they made a decision, and they again lied about this, to switch gears and go with the HST. Why did they go with the HST? Well, they went with the HST because the federal government put $1.6 billion on the table. So when you're faced with a $4 billion deficit, and remember, these people say that they're business people. They're off by a factor of nine at this point in terms of their projections. So they took the $1.6 billion to reduce that factor to a factor of five. Still, for people who say they have enormous business acumen, uh, just uh, terrible evidence in terms of the lack of acumen. Having said that, there they were. They, they took the $1.6 billion from the feds in order to bring down the deficit, and they brought in a policy which they earlier said was bad, which they now were selling as the best thing in the province. Again, uh, for the best thing for business, again, another credibility hit for the, for the government. Now, the politics, as Aaron says, is, is what I've laid up, and the politics is pretty fatal in terms of, uh, of where this government is, is at. I don't think they'll ever come out from underneath that rock. On the other side of the coin, the other mistake that they made that doesn't get a lot of news to them, that, that they get a lot of attention are as follows. First, look, they brought in the HST. They were in such a rush to take the $1.6 billion and book it to reduce the impact of the deficit, the feds came to them and said, here's Ontario's plan, here's the covering letter, sign the contract, you get your $1.6 billion, you <coughs> staple together the Ontario plan. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that we are living in a different province in Ontario. For example, the tax, sorry, the exemption for $400,000 on homes may be something that is politically palatable and passes the asset test with a public in Ontario, but surely for those of us who live in urban British Columbia understand that exemption is far too low. But the government signed on to the contract. So clearly it did even in, the, in their rush to try to get out of the political problem that they were into, they didn't even read the fine print of the tax that they were embracing with the federal government. And that's terrible in terms of saying that you bring due diligence or, or fiscal knowledge or acumen to, uh, to, to the rigor of your work. They clearly didn't do the rigor of their work. They clearly didn't look at the detail. Now what? There's no doubt in my mind that there are elements of the HST which are good for business. If you're in the forestry sector, if you're in the manufacturing sector, there's no doubt in my mind that the bringing in the, PA, uh, the, bringing in the HST will reduce your input costs. No doubt about that whatsoever. You can't really argue against that. It's like any other tax. There's always pros and cons against uh, tax. But on the other side of the coin, you've got to take a look at the cons. What these guys did do, the Campbell administration, where they did do their due diligence, was on the impact on some of the other large sectors in the province. They did, did no due diligence, in my view, on the construction sector. I've touched upon that, on the $400,000 exemption. That's an example of that. They did not do their due diligence on the tourism and hospitality sector. I can tell you, in my business, I run a hotel. It's one of the businesses I'm involved in. I also run a golf course. Uh, and that's another business I'm involved in. You know, it's clearly going to have an impact on our business, and it's going to be punitive. To, one, to a sector in this province that generates a billion dollars in revenue and is the fourth largest employer in the province. If they had done their due diligence, and if they went to Ottawa, and if they weren't blinded by the $1.6 billion that was being offered to them, they would have gone to Ottawa and said, oh, look, we, we can do this, but we need some recognition of the fact that our tourism industry has had these exemptions in the past, and we can't, we can't impact on them. We need some recognition of what's happening with real estate and construction. Final point is this. The second mistake that they made in terms of the HST is they gave up all of their jurisdiction. And I can comment about this a little bit later on, having done the Constitutional Affairs Portfolio, one of my responsibilities. What they did was they transferred provincial responsibility over taxation now to the federal government. The federal government now will make decisions as it relates to taxation policy on sales tax in this, in this, in, in this province. So the right that we had before to exempt all sorts of products because it was good for our economy has now been transferred to the feds. And that's why it's very unlikely 
you will see mitigating effects, for example, on tourism or in construction, because the feds will say we want one national standard. We don't want each province to decide what is covered and what is not covered by the HST. So they lied in summation. They brought in a tax that they didn't think, think through. They didn't do their due diligence. They got political, uh, you know, uh, they got gum all over their political shoe. They've got, they've, they've blown apart their, their reputation as being physically astute. And therefore, it's very unlikely, in my view, that they'll win the next election. <laughs> <laughs>